is episode four of Boss Up with Mr. Key. And my guest today is a good friend of mine. One of the first guys that I met when I moved here to Austin. I mean, very detail oriented guy. Actually, we worked together at one point when we lived the corporate life. And this guy had his calendar all color coordinated. Like his house was so meticulous. I'm like, damn, man, my eyes are so sloppy. I need to get like this guy. But anyway, man, he's one of the uh, the people that inspired me to, you know, leave my job and, and do what I do. And so without further ado, we have Eric Estrada here. Um, for all the listeners, Eric owns a company and what he does is paint. He will paint your house. He'll paint your business and probably a host of other things. So without further ado, let's welcome to the show, Eric Estrada. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. And uh, it's a. Uh it's actually really cool, man, to see what you're doing nowadays, man. Okay. But for, for the listeners, it's Fresh Coat. Fresh Coat. Fresh Coat Painters, yeah. Good deal, good deal. So, Eric, man, just so part of our segment is we want people to get to know you. So, hopefully, there's a kid or someone out there that sees himself in you and feels like, hey, if this guy can do it, I can do something like that as well. So, let's talk about the humble beginnings, man. Where were you born? Yeah, man. Whew, I'm going to take you way back, man. Um I'm actually, uh, I was born in Mexico. Ah. So I'm a border kid, man. I grew up in, in El Paso, Texas, and I grew up in Mexico, so I crossed the border. But I moved out here to the States when I was about 10 years old. Mm, that's, okay. when, that's when my dad, um, you know, brought us out here. And I grew up on the west side of El Paso. Ah, El Paso, no country for old men. Huh? For sure, man. It's, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's as west as you can go in Texas before you get to... New Mexico. So mm -hmm. for those that don't know and haven't been out there. So you experienced 10 years in Mexico, though, at least, huh? Yeah, yeah. We're I'm actually the first generation American for my family. Wow. Well, have you taken? Obviously, I know him, ladies and gentlemen. So this man has two fine young children. Have you taken them to Mexico? I have once when they were little, though. So uh, if you ask them, they don't they don't remember. remember. Yeah, yeah. So but uh, that's actually one of the things that I want to do this year is, mm. is I want to go take them to where I grew up. Nice. You know, so they could see uh, the motherland. Can, right? you, can you touch base with like some uncles or family members there? Yeah, for sure, man. I actually still have family out there um, in, in in Mexico. Um, I got a brother that lives in, in uh, Monterrey. Ah, uh, Monterrey. Which yeah. is which is northern Mexico. OK. Um, and so I, I still got family and I still get, you know, get out there whenever I can. And I talk to them over the phone. Sweet, sweet. So, um, so you went to El Paso, right? And what was high school like? High school was cool, man. Um, you know, for those that don't know, El Paso is a great place to grow up. Oh, uh, wow. it's actually, it was considered one of the safest cities in America, hmm. but high school was a great experience for me because I, I play sports, mm. I play basketball. And so for me, um, you know, being this El Paso is not a very big city, Yeah, man, I, I, I shined, you know, <laughs> I was, I was, I was fortunate enough to be a good player in high school. Um, so I stayed active. I, I did a lot. Good, I, I did good. a lot. It was a good experience. Um, you know, for me, uh, it's probably one of the, the highlights of my life, man. Cause Sweet. you know, I played varsity four years in high school and uh, we were the first graduating class of our high school. It was a brand new high school back then. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did you guys make it to the playoffs at least? We did, man. We went to state. Um, so yeah, it was overall, it was a good experience, man. I think you told me about a story, you know, I'm a Bears fan and and we connected because he's a Bears fan too. Sure, man. The number one pick hopefully in 2023 is ours. Uh, you mentioned that you went to a tournament and saw like Erlacher playing ball, huh? Yeah, so, um, you know, we we played in El Paso, but then we used to go outside of El Paso to play certain teams, right. certain, certain cities uh, nearby and... Um, I ended up play, playing, I think it was my junior year, maybe my senior year, um, playing uh, Brian Erlacher because he, he grew up in New Mexico. Did he dunk on you? He didn't, but that dude was massive. Man. <laughs> that dude was massive. <laughs> I was like going to say, if he would have went up, you would have had to tackle him. Yeah, that would have been the highlight. Bro, it was like guarding a buffalo, bro. I mean, <laughs> dude was massive. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Everybody, come here, come around. Hey, you know what time it is right now in the podcast. It's time for the confessions of an Austin agent. I hope I'm getting better with that. I feel like I'm I'm growing with my Vincent Price type scary Twilight Zone <laughs> type of voice. But let's see. All right, here's a story I got for you. Um, I want to set this one up here. Um, this story was... Not necessarily as a real estate agent, 
but I was a wholesaler, right? Like a wholesaler is someone that gets a house under contract for a certain price and turn around and sells that contract for a certain amount of money to an end buyer. So I went into this family. Um, grandmother died or mom and, and father died, left an estate. Um, so we sit down with the entire family, the sister, the brother, the the mean sister, the quiet sister, and then like the boyfriend who was not quite married into the family, but wanted to stand there like he was important to the family's decisions. But I digress. Um, and so we sit down and we talk and I do this presentation. Now, keep in mind, it was the early investment stages. So as an investor, I know like the lower I can get the property, the better chance that I can flip it and have a win-win situation in that in that scenario. I told these people the price. Now, I may have been like 50K, 75K lower than what they thought the value might be. Um, so the brother vouched for me. And as soon as he gave the intro, I, I, I articulated myself. And then I, I told him the price. And everybody just jumped up. You bring him here. Oh, you're trying to steal the property by sisters start arm wrestling like fighting like everybody was cursing each other out and it even got to the point where mama never liked you you crook and and so like it was crazy <laughs> and in the meanwhile like all i could do is just like sit pent to the chair making sure like i had my back against the wall i didn't want to get hit upside the head with a pole or a bottle and one of the sisters said this isn't about you but I think you should leave. So I like crept out of there. was like, hey, like once you figure it out, like give me a call. Uh, walking out of the door, I heard like tables crashing and lamps crashing. Like it sounded like a battle royal in there. But that's just another confession uh, from an Austin agent. And you know what? I, I do have to put for this particular one, put the moral of that story. And I've seen as, as a real estate investor, as a real estate agent, when families are dealing with an estate issue and it comes to money or some very sentimental items, family members, like I'm seeing mediation right before my eyes and it's not the most friendly mediation. So again, money does change people, people and family members uh, set a wedge because of dollars. But hey, we won't all get rich off of it. So it shouldn't matter that much. So from El Paso, um, you went to high school. Yep. Uh, after that, what, what happened? You Did you go to college? Yeah. So after that, I didn't really know what to do, man. I had a lot of friends that had scholarships or they knew what colleges they were going to go to. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was living in the moment and, right. um, you know, and I didn't take the steps necessary to mm -hmm. plan my next move. Uh, you know, I was I was caught up in the moment. You had and, to accept uh, what was out there as far as college at, at that point, huh? For sure, for sure. So um, I ended up staying there one year. Mm -hmm. So I went to community college. I went to uh, UTEP, okay, University okay. of Texas, El Paso. And then um, after that, I planned my next move and I ended up getting out and um, moving out to San Marcos for the rest of my college education. Mm, that is San Marcos is Texas State. Yeah. Now it's Texas. Back State. then it was what? Southwest Texas State. Boy, you're getting old. I'm telling you, bro. <laughs> SWT, SWT. All right. Got it. Got it. Got it. What'd you study in college? Man, so I ended up uh, changing my major several times, but I ended up getting a communication degree. Communications degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay. uh and so um, for me, it was one of those things that still I was trying to figure out what I right. wanted to do in life. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, I didn't want to get a degree that I couldn't use like mm -hmm. a lot of people mm -hmm. nowadays mm -hmm. end up doing. So I fell into communications because I felt like I could use that for for, you know, sports broadcasting, for example, right. or, or right. anything in radio, things like yeah. that. You know what I mean? Perfect. So um, and that was another four years of you know, great experiences, man. Good, good. I bet you had some good times down there, man. I, I happen to know you still are tight with a few buddies that you went to college with. Absolutely, man. Um, you know, friendships for me are 
you know, uh, very meaningful, mm -hmm. right? So it's not about having a lot of friendships. It's about having meaningful friendships. And, and so for me, uh, I still, yeah, I still talk to a lot of mm -hmm. uh, people that I connected with back in the day. You know what I mean? Good, good. So let me ask you this. All right. So we talked a little bit about high school, your basketball days, some college and communications. Had, did you have a seed back then about being an entrepreneur? Was there any time that you thought about, hey, I can do something, I can start this? Yeah, and the reason I did, man, is because um, my dad, right? Mm. My, my dad had a business back in El Paso. He had, he had it for like fifty years. What? Yeah, he mm. had a he had a print shop, ah, and so he mm. uh, he worked his way up, you know, from being a janitor all the way to owning it. Wow! And not only owning the business, but owning the building. Where the oh, business he was. had the real estate involved with yeah. it too. That was smart. And so for me, I grew up in the business. I helped him out. And so in the back of my head, I I knew that if if I wanted to, you know, work hard, I wanted to work hard for myself. Got it. Mm -hmm. And so I gave the corporate life, you know, a chance mm -hmm. and a few, you know, odd jobs here and there. Mm -hmm. But I still fell back to just, you know, wanting to do something on my own. Got it. Got it. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. So, man, that that's key. I, I didn't know that you saw that growing up. And did your dad do a lot of long hours? Oh, for sure, man. You know, my dad had a, a family of six he had to provide for. Mm. Yeah, I'm the youngest of six. Oh, wow. I didn't know you were the youngest. Yeah, I got four other brothers and one older sister. And, uh, you know, my, my, my mom was a housewife. Mm, so he had to hold it down. Yeah, he was yeah. a breadwinner, bro. So, you know, for me, um, I saw my dad probably two hours a day, mm, you know. Wow. I bet that's like, as far as like, especially uh, Me Mexican immigrants, I bet that's the story for a lot of people. Yep. Um, you know, big families, dad had to be the breadwinner, mom made sure the, sure the food was on the table. Yep. Made sure you wash your own damn laundry. <laughs> Bro, if you only knew. And, and me being the youngest, you know, like I got the scraps. Oh, you know? yeah. You got um, the hand-me-downs, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if but you was the tallest brother, did you have to wear the flood yeah. pants? <laughs> mom used to give me torn up jeans. I'm like, well, well, what is this? At one point, they was the style. I think right now. Yeah. They're, just... <laughs> they're coming back. <laughs> it's coming back. Yeah. All right. Cool, man. Well, I know you from the University of Phoenix. We both worked there and enrollment and helping people reach their goals. Um, and then it came a point where we were kind of checked out. Like we knew like the ship was sinking or just probably was burnt out from it. What was the key moment at that point when you decided to say, hey, because you were highly, you know, decorated at that place you mm -hmm. could have went to any company and maybe dictated your terms on the salary but what was that key moment when you said you know what i'm going to try to do do this business no that's a great question man you know um i put in 10 years in that place mm -hmm. and i had different roles and like you said man we got to a point where it was just um a lot of changes happening mm -hmm. in, in the company and um i got to a point where I had to plan my next move. You know, mm -hmm. I'm always kind of thinking for the next three years, what's going to be my next move? You know right. what I mean? And so we, I was fortunate enough to earn my education there mm -hmm. uh, as well by getting in a master's in business administration, but I wasn't putting it to use. Right. You know right. what I mean? And so for me, knew, knowing that I had that in my back pocket and then and I was getting burned out by the corporate life, mm -hmm. um, I ultimately decided to use that degree and apply it and start a business. Nice. And so I gained a lot of knowledge. I, I definitely enjoyed my time at University of Phoenix because it brought out some skills in me that I didn't know I had. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, it was important for me to use that experience, use my education and plan my next move, which was starting a business of my own. Mm -hmm. What did that look? I mean, tell me about the nerves that you had. Like, are you a little... I mean, because I know you and your family and um, you know, your wife, she's amazing and she has a great career as well. But did at any point you feel like I know you're a man's man, like I don't want to be making like having my wife take care of me if I fall on my face. Did you go through those emotions? You know, I did, man. I think it's only natural yeah, uh, for a man to go through those emotions. But it, for me, I knew that there was going to be a reward at the end of 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 that process you know mm -hmm. as they say no risk no reward right right so for me it was a conversation that i had to have with her and actually had to really almost present a business plan to her wow. you know and say look this is this is the opportunity that we have in front of us the numbers make sense mm -hmm. I, I feel confident in my skills and yeah we have to plan for it because as 
anyone who started a business before, if you don't plan, yeah, you know, you fall flat out on your face. Yeah, for sure. So I had to plan every single move along the way. Mm. But for me, man, I've never been fearful of anything. Um, If anything, it's more about um, overcoming that fear by having a plan. Mm. Because I feel like there's a lot of people that don't get to the next level, whatever that next level may be because of fear. Mm. You know, they don't want to fail. And they don't take that risk. Right. You know what I mean? So for me, I I never thought that that way. For me, it was more about if I'm going to put in the work, um, you know, I'm going to do it for myself. And there's going to be a reward at the end of that rainbow. You know what I mean? Let me ask you this, because you you did say something key that was like, hey, you have to have a plan. I mean, it'll eliminate some of the risk or help you be able to mitigate some of the risk because now you have a clear direction. Yep. But some people like over plan, they uh, uh, analysis paralysis. Yep. Like how'd you keep from doing that and just go to the because your plan is never going to be perfect. Like no matter how you try to tweak it, most of the time you'll kind of start tweaking it once you're in the business. That's a fact. How'd you keep from just over analyzing and trying to over tweak it? It got to a point where we had to leave University of Phoenix mm-hmm. and there was a period where. You know, I got um, my severance package and I didn't have um, another job that I was applying for. Mm -hmm. So that was about a two week gap where I had to not only plan that, but I had to mentally prepare myself Mm -hmm. for being on my own. And I think for me, that was probably the biggest hurdle is Mm -hmm. overcoming that mental um, obstacle. Nice. And saying, you know what, from this point on, the hustle is going to pay off. I'm going to do it on my own. I got the plan in place. I got the knowledge in place. I got the education in place. Let's, it's just time to do it, you know, mm. and taking that first step is the hardest step. Yep. Yep. And they say like the first year in business, like you can't expect to really see a profit or whatever. Sometimes that varies. Yep. Um, what was some of the early challenges that you faced? Well, there was a few, right? Um, I would say the early challenge that I have is that I didn't promote my business as much as I should have. Oh, marketing, branding, you know I mean? uh. promotion, marketing, branding. Uh, you got to let people know you're starting a business. Mm-hmm. Right. And in our industry, in the painting industry, there's a lot of competition. Mm. And so you're competing not only with your local, you know, painting store, uh, painting companies, mm-hmm. but the franchises, oh, national franchises yeah. like our like ourselves. Right. Mm-hmm. So that was the biggest hurdle for me is not not uh, being proactive in marketing. Mm. And so I had to really grind it out at first, you know, boots on the ground, mm-hmm. uh, letting people know that we were open for business. Did you have, did you ever do any door knocking? Oh, for sure. Yeah. See, door see hangers. People? Yeah. 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 I did it all, man. You know, and surely enough, little by little things started happening. I changed it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you keep a database of your clients? We do. Yeah, yeah. I have to make sure that I reach out to my old customers as well mm-hmm. um, and, and kind of reactivate them. Right. You know, letting them know that we're still around. <laughs> Offering our services. Referrals. Referrals is the best. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, we learned that a long time ago, right? Referrals convert really well. So Yeah, for sure, man. And, you know, referrals is actually one of the probably key moves that I made when we started the business is actually join our referral Mm -hmm. uh, networking uh, group. Right. And that really helped us get some business going Hmm. because there were referrals, right? They They were coming from people that were business owners or uh, people that uh, could use our services. Mm-hmm. And so they started promoting us. What's the networking group? I, I remember going a couple of times, but what was the name of it's it? It's called BNI. BNI, you still a member? Still a member. Yeah. Um, for those that don't know, it stands for Business uh, Networking International. Mm. And uh, been a member for eight years now. Wow, wow. How do uh, like how does a person listening that start in a business, how do they get involved with a BNI? You know, there's a lot of chapters um, here in Austin uh-huh. and in, in every city and in every state. So okay. it's just a matter of uh, going online and looking up networking uh, organizations right. and figuring out what what uh, chapters close to you where you live or mm-hmm. where your business is. Right. Right. And visiting. Here's here's something that um, I want to talk to you about. Um, it's something that I, you know, I work and strive towards myself is work-life balance, right? Now that you're the CEO, the boss of your own company, Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you do a little bit of payroll, sometimes you're the marketing director, sometimes you wear a lot of hats. Um, How do you keep a level of work-life balance? Man, that's a good question. Um, 
I, I think it's, there's a matter, there's, there's a saying, right? You either work on your business or in your business mm. and kind of keeping that in the, in the forefront of your mind is important because I got two small kids. Yeah. You know, I got a, a 12 and a nine mm. year old. And of course, with my wife, right? And they're doing sports and yeah, participating in things. Exactly. So yeah. the, as, as they get older, they're more involved in things. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it's about making sure that as soon as I cross that gate in my house, that I leave all work behind. Mm-hmm. Now, does it always happen? Nope. I mean, t- you probably creep up to that office at midnight when you can't sleep sometime. And Not only that, man, but, you know, I try to use my, my time wisely. And there's a lot of admin work. Mm. you know, behind the scenes that I got to do. Right. And so um, I try to spend enough time with my kids and my, my family in general. Mm-hmm. But whenever there's downtime, instead of watching TV, you know, I, I, I do a little bit of work. Yeah. yeah but it's, good. it's, you're right, man. Like work and life balance is important because you can spend too much time working yeah. and not enough time with it's family zone and you can easily block everybody out, which isn't good. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so maybe it's safe to say that sometimes you're watching the bears games and when they start losing, you just grab the laptop and just, <laughs> why you got to bring that up, man? Come on, bro. Hey, it's going so well, man. Come we, on. Now. Hey, we sucking for number one, number one pick. <laughs> hey, that's all I care about now at this point in the game. Um, all right. So man, we, we talked a lot about like you just getting on your grind and, and doing what you have to do for this business. Um, you employ people too, right? Yeah, so for for those that don't know, right? Uh, when you're when you're a contractor like myself, mm-hmm. you have the option of hiring employees mm-hmm. or or subcontracting the work out. Okay. And and I have done both. And for me, um, if let's say if I subcontract a workout to a crew, that crew stays with me for for as long as they can. Right. So it, for me, it's important for the audience to know that the people that work for me may not be 100% employees, they may be subcontractors, but it's it's like they're employees because they've been working for me for years ah. and only me, hmm. you know what I mean? So, um, you know, I have a crew, I have four crews hmm. currently going on uh, of about three to four painters each. Wow, that's good. And they, and they keep me busy, man, and I keep them busy, you know, but they, again, they work for me. Is is an old cliche, uh, good help is hard to find. Um, I had uh, my last guy here. He uh, owns a, a cleaning company, mm-hmm. and many times he said that people wouldn't show up, and he had to pick up a mop and yep. play the role of janitor. How many times have you had to whirl that paintbrush yourself? Yeah, man. Um, early days, right? First mm-hmm. year in business. Oh, okay, got it. You know, what I mean, I, I had to do that because the job needed to get done, mm-hmm. and customer doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, they don't care who does it, whether yeah. it's you or somebody else. You got a deadline. I need to get it done. Huh? For sure. Yeah. So I'm not too prideful to do that. And uh, to this day, if a job needs to get done, I'll do it. Mm. But we've been fortunate enough to grow and, and to have people in place where I don't have to do that. Yeah. It's good. It's good help hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the number one challenge for a lot of uh, business owners, man, in, yeah. in our industry, you know, in the service industry is not <laughs> finding um, the help that you need. And really retaining that help, mm, you know, yeah. you could always find people, but it's retaining them uh, that becomes a second that challenge. Good. Yeah, you got to be able to take care of them. It's a thin line between not giving up too much of your bottom line to overpay them, but, you know, keep them happy pretty much. Yeah, man. And that's the thing is that for me, um, and again, this goes back to my my background, mm-hmm. you know, different jobs that I've had developing certain people skills. Mm-hmm. Being able to treat people like humans, mm. you know, um, yeah, they're working for you, but at the end of the day, they're they got hu- a family they too. They got a family. They're, they're human yeah. just like you. They got feelings. They got emotions, and you know, it's all about respect. Mm. It's all about treating them like they're human, like you know, fair, and yeah. and acknowledging the the work that they're doing. You know, yeah. Southwest Texas communication degree paid off a little bit. <laughs> Man, I, I gotta apply everything that I've gained over my you know forty three. Years in, in this planet, man. Forty three, man. I see graves. You sure you're not sh- uh, point man, shaving? Shots fired, bro. Shots fired. <laughs> well, that's cool, man. I mean, um, same thing with me. Just you know, I have some contractors, and I and I continue to try to grow. And um, it's important to find people that kind of align with your vision. You know, you can hire somebody or work with some contractors that think oh, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to try to take his business and do the same mm-hmm. thing he does or whatever, but. I mean, everybody isn't us, and to work for yourself, it takes a 
a special grit. Like nobody forces you to get up in the morning and start to work. Um, you won't get like a, a reprimand for coming to work late or anything like that. So you have to have that internal motivation to get your ass up. Yeah, for sure, man. And I think it's important to bring up also that there's a comfort zone that can be dangerous. Mm. You know what I mean? Tell me about that. Yeah. So if you are um, comfortable in your job, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you, you're you accustomed to doing the same thing day in and day out, knowing that there's going to be a paycheck, right, coming your way. You, a lot of times you may not um, see yourself doing anything else because of that comfort. It has they, your lifestyle set kind of. It may not be the way you want it, but you're comfortable enough to. Yeah. You know, hmm. you know you're still going to get paid, right? Yeah. But when you're a business owner. The, the grind's got to come from somewhere yeah. and hopefully that somewhere is you, right? Like, <laughs> so you got to really wake up and know that if you don't put in the effort, you don't put in the time and, and the grit and, and the grind that you need to put in to make money, right? you know, you ain't going to see the, the result. You're not going to eat, right? Yeah, you're not going to eat, bro. So well, one of the things is why I enjoy being an entrepreneur. That part is that part. Like, hey, if you don't work, like shit's not happening. You're not going to eat. But if you work your ass off, you get to reap the huge benefits as opposed to working for corporate. They're just going to give you 40 hours a week, maybe overtime, but yep. you can bust your ass, you make them millions of dollars and you get the scraps at the bottom. Exactly. You know, and, and that's at the end of the day, what I feel like if you're interested in becoming a business owner, right. Or an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. you really have to look inside yourself and, and decide if, if you're going to, have that that grit that you talk about to to grind it out for the first three to five years mm. because as you know most businesses they they don't make it past the first three it. years yeah exactly and so for me it was you know kind of like i said going back to to my statement earlier just having that mental capacity to mm-hmm. to know that the first three years the business was going to be the hardest mm-hmm. and if it's if i was able to overcome that then hopefully things were going to get better right yeah and now it's going, going we're going into the eighth year wow that's crazy eight years huh? yeah man hmm. looking back was fresh um uh, fresh coat the right decision as far as uh the company? yeah yeah it was you know when i when i sat down with my wife um we looked at different options mm-hmm. uh in, in the franchise world right and we landed on painting and we looked at three different companies and fresh coat was the best fit for us hmm. and and so we pulled the trigger and it's just funny how things worked out man because when i was ready to purchase the the franchise, mm-hmm. um, it, it, they give you a certain service area uh, yeah. and the service area that we wanted was already bought by someone else. Right. Mm. But that lady ended up selling and getting out of the business. So, mm. so she got out at the time that I was buying into it. Mm. So and it so it worked out perfect. It worked huh? out, man. Yeah. It worked out perfect where even the franchise uh, developer was in Cedar park, which is close to Pflugerville where I used to live. Uh-huh. And that same day that I expressed interest, he came over to my house, showed me the paperwork discuss you know the next steps and you know sat on it for for a day or two and you know made the move man so and and that's good man i'm glad that you like it seemed like it was meant to be all these little different factors start to work yep at the perfect time um here's your your plug right here so why would someone use fresh coat over you know the guy that has a little crew that i'll charge you you know it's probably dirt cheap like you know why would right. I go with fresh coat? You know, that question comes up a lot, right? But it's more about what you as a customer, as a consumer want, right? Mm-hmm. If you want to feel, because nothing's guaranteed. Mm-hmm. So the way I would answer that is if you as a consumer want to feel like you're hiring a company that's trustworthy, mm-hmm. that can, you know, be responsible if anything goes wrong, mm-hmm. right? That you can always call the the owner and handle any issues. Mm-hmm then I would say you can call us. Mm. And the reason I say that confidently is because I wear three hats. I am the business owner, right? Mm-hmm. I'm the operations manager, mm-hmm. and I'm also the project manager. Mm. So, and, and the estimator, right? right? So, so, you know, I'm, I'm there from beginning all the way to the middle and the end. So that's perfect. Like you got the owner of the company making sure he give his stamp of approval, he's giving you the estimate. Um, and they have that streamline of communications with you as well. Right. So for me, if I say we're going to do something, my name's behind it all. Right. So I need to make sure everything goes smoothly and that at the end of the day, we deliver on what we're going to say we're going to do. Mm-hmm. And it's all about professionalism, you know, making sure that the customer has a, a great experience so that right. they're able to refer us to the next person because we try to grow organically. Right. That's huge. That's huge. 
man. So with 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 that being said, and I tell people too, like, yeah, you can go with a discount company or what so have you. It's kind of like you feel like eating filet mignon today or do you want to eat spam? Like, you know, that's on you. That spam, I don't know how good it is for you in the long term. Right. Like in your business, hey, you may get a guy. I've had the worst experience with contractors the past couple of years, starting a job, disappearing, not finishing, having to fire one and get another one. This shit is frustrating. So, Well, and, that, and that's actually another good point, right, is that one of the things that sets us apart is that when we start a project, mm-hmm. we don't we don't start and then jump to another one mm-hmm. and then come back and finish the first one. Right. We stay in that project until we finish and then done. we move on to the next one. Right. Mm-hmm. But, you know, one of the things that you brought up is that you have a, a hard time, you know, finding contractors. Mm-hmm. And for, for us, you know, we're a franchise, so we we can handle any anything that comes our way. You know, ah. we have access to different crews and there's three owners here in the city that serve as a whole city. Hmm. And so regardless of where the job is, Freshco can So is it more it. than paint? Like if I need like, hey, I need some new baseboards, I just got some flooring done or something like that, like you all can do other stuff as well? Yeah, absolutely. We can paint anything. We're a full interior and exterior painting company. Ah, no, I'm saying outside of paint. Like, Outside of painting, we do some, uh, you know, woodwork. Okay, okay. But we try to stick to what we do. Would you paint uh, cabinets? If oh, I... that's that's probably the number one requested thing for us. Ah, good, so we do good. a lot of cabinet painting for sure. Right, that's cool. That's good. Like anything, all things painting on a property, and you can take care of it for pretty sure. Much. Got it. Got it. All right. Let's step back a little bit. Let's talk about. Uh, I have a segment on my show where. Um, you just talk about real estate experiences, the crazy things I've seen in the industry. And so like in your business, just like mine, you're walking into people's houses and not to put anything on anyone on blast. But what mm-hmm. is the craziest, the most bizarre thing that you've seen on the job site or maybe just meeting a client for the first time? Man, where do I start? <laughs> so. I would say probably the craziest thing that I've seen is a couple of years ago, I walked into a house um, and I didn't know where to step. Hoarder? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the the, the homeowner was a, a disabled person mm-hmm. uh, on a wheel, in a wheelchair. And I think he had probably four or five dogs. Wow. And you could imagine just walking in um, stuff everywhere. The smell. The smell. Yeah. You know, not being able to walk to even measure rooms, bro. You know, How are you going to get to the walls? I'm I'm thinking that there was stuff stacked up against the walls in there too. Yeah, halfway up. <laughs> oh, halfway man. up. And and so for me, um, you know, for me it's 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 a it's a time where I have to make a decision if that's going to be the right project for us. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? So professionally speaking, you know, I did what I had to do. Um, I ended up quoting the customer. Um, and, and, you know, doing it as fast as I could because the smell was pretty bad. <laughs> I bet. I'm not going to lie, but that was probably one of the worst things that I've ever been a part of. Man. Oh, man. Yeah, I've had some hoarders and it's, yeah. I've seen rats, everything in the house. Seen like, that? Nah, I got to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't do rodents. Man, that's crazy. So, you know, you go out and do an estimate. Um, Nothing's foolproof because stuff can happen. Like, is there... Just a typical rule of thumb for painters or contractors. Is there a variance with that that offer that you give them? Yeah, man, absolutely. The reason being is that I just actually got asked this question earlier. So a lot of times customers will call in and just try to get a, a price per square foot. Mm. But there's a lot of variables and factors that go into pricing something out, such as, you know, how many coats of paint you're going to use, right? Mm. Um, are you prime? Are you having to prime before you oh, paint? Yeah. Um, are you having to do some certain kind of drywall repairs, mm. which is common? Yeah, yeah. Um, are you buying the paint, or is the customer buying it? Mm. You know what I mean. So there's a there's a lot of different variables that go into pricing uh, the job out. And so for me, I never price anything over the phone. Uh, you got to come see. It. I got to put my eyes, eyes on, on everything, yeah. man, because I've been burned. Mm. I've been burned, and I learned from that. And so for me, I always tell the customers, look, it's me coming out. I'm going to give you a fair, but most importantly, an accurate mm. proposal because I'm going to measure everything. I'm going to see the, the work that's going to go into making your house look top notch. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. And people don't understand. Like I've been burned, too. And when you say you've been burned, I wanted to see if it's the same thing where you have to eat the cost on certain stuff sometimes. Yep, that was yeah. because it was my fault, right? Yeah, you, you got to own up to it. Instead of fighting the customer as a good business owner, sometimes you got to know, like, man, I dropped the ball. I need to pay for that. Um, is there a time when you kind of... Um, well, we talked about that, like as far as you know, basically you got to fire a client like, you know, or, or have you ever been halfway yeah. through a job and just like, man, I I can't work for this dude anymore. Like not not once we start a job, we finish it. OK, no, no matter what no matter the experience. What. Oh, yeah. No matter legit. what the experience is. But I have declined a job. Mm, you know, we, yeah. we get to a point where we just have certain disagreements before we even start the, the project. Uh, you're like, no, nah, I don't want to work with it. all money isn't good money, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Don't right. just chase after stuff that's going to right. not be conducive to your time. Right. Because it's you got to keep in mind that it's not about the relationship that I have with the customer, but it's also putting my painters in that situation. Mm. Right. Putting my guys in that situation where they're having to deal with the homeowner and, you know, they're micromanaging my oh, guys. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't want to put my guys to that. You know, so for mm -hmm. me, it's about making making that that tough call at, at the end of the day that that project may not be the best one for us. Mm hmm. And mm -hmm. as long as you treat it respectfully and professionally, you know, you'll be all right. You'll be good. You'll be good. So um, there's this question I want to ask, but every time I'm about to ask it, it, it slips. Um, this is a segment when we do like special talents, man. So I read your bio. I said you can sing. So we need you. To nah, <laughs> I don't know whose bio you read, bro. It wasn't mine. Man, we had the guitar ready. You like did acapella with acoustic. You know, it's, it's funny you say that, man, because I was just talking to my son about that. You know, I grew up in, a, in an environment where, you know, it was work, 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 work. And, yeah. and you know, go to school and, mm -hmm. and play sports, but nothing musical. Yeah. And I wish that I had some kind of musical influence growing up mm -hmm. because I don't know how to play any instrument, bro. Mm. You know, I don't, I can't sing. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> shower singer. Huh? Yeah. So <laughs> I'm actually trying to get my son to, to learn how to play a certain oh, instrument. That's dope. Yeah. You yeah. got to get your kids and not only in sports and the arts or whatever have you. I, right. I, I like that too. This, I remember the question now, you know, I got an accounting background, so Part of uh, having a successful business and being able to have the longevity that you've had is understanding how to manage your finances, you know. For sure. How long did it take for you to adapt that or was that something that you kind of already had as a skill set? No, you know what? Um, in the beginning, I actually had to have all those people in place to handle mm -hmm. those things for me, right? Because mm -hmm. as a business owner, you can wear, like you were saying, you can wear a lot of hats, right? Yeah. You can handle it all. But for me... I wanted to focus on two things, mm -hmm. sales, which right. is my background mm -hmm. and, you know, the service part of it, right? Mm -hmm. Customer service, everything else. I had to have people in place to help me with those things. Perfect. Perfect. So I, I knew from the beginning that I wasn't, I wasn't going to try to step outside of my comfort zone and mm -hmm. handle those areas of the business. Right. So that's why I hired people. So your business money goes into a business account and you just pay yourself and your, your contractors out of that. And, just let the rest keep growing the business, right? Right, right. And yeah. you know, I I have uh, have a an accountant that handles sweet. You know, yeah. all all the number side. Mm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. A lot of people co mingle all those funds, and now like they're riding in a Range Rover because their business might have hit like three hundred thousand in a quarter. But you don't understand that that's business money. Like right. you created this entity. That's your child. That money belongs to that entity. Right. Not all of it to you. Of course, you'll pay yourself when you decide what kind of salary you want. But it's important out there to make sure that you can manage your funds before your money manages you. And not only that, man, but keep reinvesting in the business. Yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah, that's key. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you you can't just go crazy because you get a nice paycheck from a customer mm -hmm. and go splurge. I mean, you can do that, right. but you want to make sure that, you know, you, you you can use that money to invest, right. reinvest in the business, whether that's it's true. on the marketing side, mm -hmm. whether it's just, you know, uh, new equipment or something new like equipment, that. Equipment, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. anything that's going to help your brand. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I do a lot of that. I like put everything up, not everything, but I put a nice chunk in the marketing because that's the thing. It's like, hey, if you don't continue to feed this baby, it's not going to grow. As they know? say, man, you got to make money to to make money to make take money. money to make money. Yeah, you know what no I mean? Doubt. That's true. That's true. Well, hey, man, Eric, man, I appreciate you coming to the show, like giving people just an idea of. How a kid from El Paso, matter of fact, you weren't even born in El Paso, nah, a kid man. straight from Mexico, come here 
And I don't want to tell them about your house and like how many acres you sitting on because, you know. Hey, man, keep it on the <laughs> down low, bro. I don't want to put you out there like that. But, man, you've come a long way, man. Appreciate and it, bro. If, if the people want to find you, if, if anybody out there needs your service, tell them how they can get a hold of you. Yeah, man. So, you know, you can go to Fresh Code North Austin mm. um, and, and find us on Facebook that way or go directly to our page. Um, you know, for me, I try to stay on top of all my social media and try mm-hmm. to connect with everybody. Right. Sweet. But you can find us on any social media platform. You can find us on Yelp. You can find mm-hmm. us on Facebook, Instagram. Um, we're, we're everywhere, man. Mm-hmm. You know, so for me, I would love to help your listeners and your customers out, man. You know, um, they go hand in hand, free estimates. And I do them all. Oh, nice. That's an efficient free estimate, man. One last phrase or statement. You see the kid out there just like, hey, you know, corporate life isn't for me. I have the grid. I want to, you know, do my own thing. Like what kind of advice would you give this person? Have a plan in place. Mm. And more importantly, have a safety net, meaning the plan will help you in the next two or three steps. Right. Moving right. forward. But have that safety net to where if your plan doesn't work out you at least have something to fall back on. Mm. Because I think a lot of times you may have that courage, that grit that we talked about and take that next step. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you make it, sometimes you don't. Right. And what the last thing you want to do is fall flat yeah. and not have yeah. you know a safety net, right? Mm-hmm. And especially if you're married, man, you know, you got to look out for your family. Not just you. Yeah. Not just you. You got to think about the people around you and how they're going to be impacted by That's true. you know what may turn out to be a bad decision. Right. That's, that is so true. I mean, I tell people if you're if you're going to be the business owner, you have to be able to fund your business. Yep. And unless you have the mouth mouthpiece to get like other investors, which can be difficult in the beginning, you have to have something to fund your business savings, another part time job or something to kind of springboard you into that next step. And so those are key words to live by. Again, uh. This is Boss Up with Mr. Key. This is my friend and the number one boss in Fresh Coat, Eric Estrada. Hey, does he come to the family reunions? Man, I've tried to reach out to that dude, man, but he he just keeps sending me the voicemail, bro. <laughs> Can't get him out here, man. <laughs> hey, man, we're going to put it on your social media, the real Eric Estrada. <laughs> and, <laughs> and there we go again, another show, number four. It's a wrap. Thanks, man. <laughs>